O Lord, we beseech thee, keep thy household, the church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in good works to the glory of thy holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to cancel that hymn. Oh, 295, sing praise to our creator, O you of Adam's race, God's children by adoption, baptized into his grace. Well, we start with Dr. Herman Ritterboss's relitigation, not relitigate, pellet review, we'll call it, of Veach versus Boltman. 52 page document by Herman Ritter Boss. Modern Thinkers series by David H. H. Freedom, the editor. Boltman, man who's just obnoxious in every sense of the word. By Ritter Boss, translated by Freeman. 1960, Presbyterian Reform Publishing standards selected bibliography the author introduction Boltman's general position his affiliation with radical criticism his form historical method Boltman and the method of history of religion Boltman and existentialism which is where he's at he's a Heideggerian Boltman and Bart that'll be interesting Boltman's theological program so-called mythological character of the New Testament, form and essence of the New Testament message, basic feature of the New Testament message, the relation of the New Testament and existentialism, the significance of Christ's redemptive work and resurrection criticism, Boltman's methodological interpretation of the history of redemption, his definition is of the mythical, Myth and the New Testament concept of God. Myth and the witness of the resurrection. Myth and the act of God in Jesus Christ. Boltman's existentialism interpretation of redemptive history. The great reduction. The view of man. Conclusion. Existentialism. Balti in the New Testament. Brief bibliography. All German works. Full of their bibliography may found in Feschrift, Rudolf Boltman, in English found by Rudolf Boltman, Jesus Christ in mythology. I will not reread this junky crap again. The author is the author of his monograph, this monograph on Rudolf Boltman, which has been translated for this Modern Thinkers series by Dr. David H. Freeman of the philosophy department of Rhode Island University. It appeared originally as a chapter in the Dutch publication, Modern Thinkers. Dr. Ritterboss has been a professor of New, New Testament studies since 1943 in the theological seminary at Kampen, the Netherlands. His fa father, J. Ritterboss, was professor in Old Testament in the same seminary and his brother, Dr. N. H. Ritterboss, professor of Old Testament in the Free University of Amsterdam. From 1934 to 1942, Dr. Ritterboss was a minister of the Reformed Churches in the Netherlands. He is a graduate of seminary at Campen, received his doctorate at the Free University of Amsterdam. The author of many scholarly publications, Dr. Ritterboss, is the editor of the Reformed Weekly, one of the leading ecclesiastical periodicals in the Netherlands. He became well known in America through his volume on Galatians and the NIC and Paul and Jesus, the origin and general character of Paul's teaching and the history of redemption in Holy Scripture, a study of the canonicity in his major work, The Coming of the Kingdom, 
an explication of the theology of the synoptics are currently being translated by Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing. <clears throat> Introduction. Rudolph, retired professor of New Testament of the University of Marburg, is today the center of interest throughout the theological world. The cause of his... Oops, I'm sorry. Will that work? Is due to what Boltman has written in the course of the years concerning various problems which deal with the origin of the New Testament. But rather, it is especially due to the manner in which he tries to interpret the message of the New Testament for our generation. Boltman definitely disclosed his position in summarizing address entitled New Testament and Myth, which he delivered in 1941 at Elpersbach to the Gesellschaft für Evangelische Theologie. The address created a tremendous storm throughout the German theological world, a storm which has not subsided, but which appears to be spreading. An increasing number of scholars outside of Germany are becoming occupied with the problems posed by Boltman and the number of publications devoted to the latter, both great and small, continues to grow. And to keep abreast of the status of the discussion in Germany now and again, we find collections of the most important and characteristic publications concerning the theology of Boltman. Naturally, it is possible, as frequently occurs, that this new point of view will presently lose its popularity and be forgotten. On the other hand, we must seriously consider the possibility that this new conception is characteristic and will remain representative for the theological development of the middle of the 20th century just as rationalism, romanticism, and idealistic theological movements were characteristics of the present time. I'll break in here. I can tell you I've heard Episcopal sermons that are explicitly and definingly Boltmanian. And these little rhubarbs who go to their s schools pick that up like they, they're poisoned. Because they're too, too illiterate and ill-read. And they got to follow the pack of New Testament, man. I'm thinking of a crummy sermon at Fredericksburg, Holy Trinity Episcopal. That's a long story there. Or the moron. Whoops. Not moron. Yeah, he's a moron. Fool. Thought he was wise. Made himself foolish over and over again. Nobody. <laughs> a little congregation, about 10 people. <coughs> Boltman's theology can be called an existentialist approach, an exposition of the biblical message. Existentialist philosophy is very characteristic of the attitude to life. <coughs> Many in our time, but the fact <coughs> that Boltman's theology is determined completely by philosophic existentialist conceptions of man life in the world explains to a large me measure the great number of his adherents and also the sharp opposition to him. It is therefore meaningful that the non-professional theologian interests himself in this figure, for his theology is a typical phenomenon of the time. Boltman does not concern himself with the periphery of modern life but he operates with unusual competence where the great modern theological and philosophical traditions reach their contemporary fork focus. It is for this reason that his influence must not be investigated in a trivial manner. Boltman's theology is a challenge to orthodoxy, and in a certain sense, it is also a challenge to liberalism. That is, it is a challenge that orthodoxy will appear in the course of this essay. The statement that it is also a challenge to liberalism is meant in the sense that it is Boltman's theology, a new major conception of liberal thought is presented, a conception which breaks with all the various older liberal views 
and offers in their place a new radical reformation to liberal thought. It remains to be seen as to whether or not liberal theology, which in many respects is itself seeking new paths, will allow itself to be brought under this banner, or whether it here and there be brought closer to orthodoxy as expressed in the great ecclesiastical confessions. But one thing is clear, Boltman's position signifies a renewal of the conflict between liberal and biblical thought, and therefore cannot be bypassed in a depreciating or derogatory manner. Boltman's general position, Boltman's affiliation with radical criticism, who is Boltman? First, a few biographical facts. Rudolf Bultmann was born in a minister's family on August 20, 1884, at Oldenburg. He studied at Marburg, and with the exception of his short absence from 1916 to 21, was instructor, privat docent, there until 1922, when he became a professor, succeeding his teacher, Heitmuller. Until recently, Bultmann worked as a New Testament scholar advancing the liberal tradition of the theological faculty at Marburg. Boltman belongs to the radical critical wing of German biblical criticism, yet he has given this criticism new ways, new paths, new perspectives. The history of radical biblical criticism in Germany has undergone various phases began in the so-called enlightenment of the 18th century. Sometime later, under the influence of the spirit of the time, specific schools arose in which the main thoughts of the enlightenment were applied and developed in the sphere of biblical criticism. It is well known, for example, that the so-called Tübingen school, of which Friedrich Christian Bauer was the father, is strongly under Hegelian influence, later followed by the liberal school of H.J. Holtzman, Adolf Harnock, Heitmuller, Juliker, and others, which held sway until far into the 20th century. For it is the kernel of the gospel, was the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus sought to be a spiritual kingdom of love. Only the preaching of Jesus, and not his person, belongs to the original gospel. To this liberal school, there is joined the history of religion movement, which placed the emphasis upon religious feeling and explained Christianity, especially in its supernatural, Christological, and cosmological manifestation in terms of the latter Jewish and pagan religions of about beginning, beginning of the Christian era especially in terms of the Hellenistic mystery religions and the so-called pre-Christian Gnosticism. Prominent representatives of this movement were, for example, Bousset and Rietzensheim, Boltman's form historical method. It would take us too far afield to investigate the manner in which Boltman has been influenced by and differs from the radical critical schools. Boltman has followed the course which they have set. Jesus is for him also nothing but a man whom the later faith of the church has made a deity. Stop. Vigorously anti-Chalcedonian, anti-historic, anti-confessional, anti-gospels. I have very, very strong feelings on Boltman. I spent two years digging around on that man, reading everything I could. Two years just to that moron. Don't even get me started. I, get, I really get upset about Boltman. I don't usually get upset. Everything's calm and balanced. It's, I try to be, I have a quiet life here. But when it comes to Boltman, I, I become a bull. Wave the red flag in front of each the bull. Jesus is for him nothing but a man whom the later faith of the church made a deity. 
However, whereas the liberal theology tried to reconstruct out of the Gospels a life of Christ free of the supernatural cadre in which it had been placed by the evangelists, Boltman recognizes that this is not possible. He is aware of the fact that the history of Jesus, as told in the Gospels, is from A to Z a supernatural history which at the same time bears the character of preaching. According to Boltman, this preaching does not give us a trustworthy account of what occurred. It represents only the faith of the later church break. And this is why you've always got these guys trying to date the gospel way off into the ages. Constant impulse to that direction. And the, the, this faith of the later church and its accompanying theology has taken such a thorough hold of what was originally said by Jesus that it is extremely difficult to derive from this proclamation of the faith a clear picture of what Jesus actually said and did. Boltman considers it firmly established that Jesus expected the kingdom of God to be ushered in in the near future. Because of this expectation and preaching, he entered into conflict with the Jewish and Roman authorities and died on the cross. The Gospels contain words and sayings ascribed to Jesus, which actually have a historical kernel, the famous word break, kernel and husk. And the husk in most of the New Testament, we've got to dig in behind. See if we can find something that was historically factual. These sayings are no longer to be established with any certainty. Whether or not Jesus, for example, considered himself to be this Messiah is not to be established on the basis of any data available to us. Personally, Boltman thinks that Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah, but he acknowledges that others can with as little absolute certainty be of a different opinion the gospels according to boltman are not concerned with jesus but with the faith and the preaching of the church with respect to jesus and what interests him as an historian is the question how did this preaching acquire the form or in any words along what way or in what manner has this preaching grown up or developed into our gospel accounts? To this end, Bolte, I'm going to call him Bolte, not Dr. Ritterboss is not doing it, but I, again, I just have no use for Boltman. So I'm going to call him Bolte. Bolte tries to go back from the first three gospels to the form of existence of the gospel tradition before it was brought together into a unity in the gospel story. The results of a very detailed investigation have been published in a voluminous book, Der Geschichte der Synoptischen Tradition. I got that moron up there. In fact, there he is sitting there. Well worked over, well printed notes. Uh, you know, I really ran hard. <sighs> The method of investigation is called form, historical form, Geschichte method. Boltman excludes the Gospel of John from this investigation. In his opinion, this book is much less historical in nature than its predecessors. It is a product of a later time in which the author makes use of other pre-Christian motives and thereby clothes the Christian faith in a strong, symbolic, mythical form, and thus gives an account of the manner in which for Jesus was at the same time the Word became flesh, the crucified one, the Son of God. I'm going to stop again and just point it out how vividly anti-Chalcedonian this is. This guy actually taught theology actually was a New Testament professor. <sighs> the historicity of the light, and he's calling all the apostles frauds, forgers, crummy thinkers. 
arrogance of these some of these German guys is unbelievable. Boltman is extremely enthralled by the manner in which this gospel has brought to faith the Christian faith. Boltman has written an extensive commentary on the fourth gospel, which of its sort is a masterpiece of scholarship and of interpretation. In spite of its high price, it has become in short time one of the most widely read theological works in Germany and elsewhere. Boltman and the method of the history of religion. In addition to the form Geschichte or the form historical method, which insofar as it deals with the first three gospels, is often involved in a very minute and detailed literary criticism. Boltman makes very broad use of the so-called method of the history of religion. That is to say, he tries in various ways to show connections between the New Testament and non-Christian religions. In a certain sense, one can say that he is forced to do this. For if the picture that the Gospels give of Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension is not historical in character, but is the mythological formation of the faith of the Christian church. The question arises as to how this formation has occurred. It is impossible, even for Boltman, to think that the church resorted simply to fantasy. Boltman tries to show, following such people as Bousset, Ritzenstein, and others, that this formation is determined in many ways by the religious conceptions everywhere found in the Hellenistic world in which the young church arose. It is for this reason that the Christian faith soon resulted in a syncretism of various conceptions. When the New Testament speaks, for example, of Jesus as the Son of God, there are in this designation various elements to be distinguished. The original Jewish congregation of Jerusalem would understand <clears throat> by this name nothing more than Jesus' messianic kingship, in which any thought of a supernatural divine essence would still be entirely lacking. To those pagan listeners who were converted to the Christian faith, this name would naturally indicate the divine essence the divine nature of Christ, by virtue of which he was distinguished from the human sphere. It was in this sense that the name Son of God was used by Paul, who, according to Boltman, was very strongly under the influence of Hellenistic religions. Oh, yikes. The name would still have another meaning in certain passages of the first three Gospels. Here, the Old Testament idea of a king or the Hellenistic conception was not developed as strongly as the mysterious, miraculous power over which Jesus had command, and which placed him upon the same nivu in the consciousness of the Christian church as the well-known Hellenistic miracle workers who also called themselves sons of God and were thought of as intermediary beings, godmen, heroes. These godmen were viewed as the product of a mixture of a divine and a human essence. They appear not only in the Greek tradition, but also in the Babylonian and especially in the Egyptian legends of the kings. Moreover, when in connection with the history of Jesus' birth, he is spoken of as being conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. We must directly or indirectly bring these stories into relationship with these pagan conceptions. Later on, however, this conception of Jesus as a divine man is entirely surpassed by the previously mentioned conception according to which Jesus was a self-sufficient or an independent divine being who descended from the heavens. 
the latter conception is particular it receives its particular form not from the old Greek religions, but from the later pre-Christian Gnosticism, according to which an existent being comes from the comes upon the earth to conduct a conflict or struggle against the powers of darkness. As much as we're enjoying Dr. Ritterboss's very clear and very adequate summary of Boltman. Uh, we're going to take our leave for a bit. I've had enough of Boltman. To Jesus Christ give glory, God's co-eternal Son. As members of his body, we live in him. That's one. That's certainly not something that Rudy could have sung. Let us pray. Nor could Rudy pray this prayer either. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, and wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Godspeed.